pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Starskosa. Uh, Dr. Starskosa is uh, a nuclear physicist and associate professor at Simon Fraser University, a great university. He specializes in the structure of nuclei for our home stability, nuclear shapes and shape coexistence, nuclear symmetries, symmetries nuclear fission, nucleosynthesis, and distribution of elements instrumentation for nuclear science experiments. He monitors IDAN 131 in Rainwater on Burnaby Mountain and uh, got a really good natural experiment coming his way shortly after the events in Fukushima, which he'll talk about. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. Thank you very much to, uh, for an opportunity to speak here. I uh, probably will say things which may not necessarily be uh, appreciated, but uh, I need to tell them probably anyway. And uh, to be uh, specific, I would like to stress that what I'm going to talk about is the results in British Columbia. So whatever I'm talking about is particular to British Columbia, has nothing to do with uh, Fukushima. We monitored in British Columbia and our data is representative for British Columbia. Okay? So if I have to divide it, uh, okay. All right. if, uh, if, if I would like to boil my talk to three points, here are the points. Point number one is that techniques to monitor radiation levels are well established and available at many places, including the nuclear science research facility at Simon Fraser University, uh, and we are in the Department of Chemistry, uh, and uh, this uh, allowed us to, to do this measurement. And what we've done was that um, my team, the nuclear science team from the Institute of the Department of Chemistry, followed the time profile of IBM 131 from the Fukushima fallout, from March 16, 2011 until mid April 2011 in rainwater, and from March 15 to uh, 2011 until end, early May of 2011 in seaweed. And then what we've done is we uh, done comparisons, and these are the comparisons which I would like to present, and these are comparisons to natural background radiation levels, literature data on previous accidents, medical doses used in diagnostic and treatments, and results of other measurements, and essentially, our conclusion was that there is no significant impact on the environment in this field. So, I don't laugh often when you see the data. Okay. So, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of talk about iron 131. Iron 131 is a man-made radioactive isotope of iodine. is used in diagnostics and radiotherapy of cancer. Accumulates in diary, does large scale exposure, it is a potential health hazard, which was a concern, has a half life of eight days. It's found in the is not found in the atmosphere in normal conditions. So the normal atmosphere should not have an iron for lung. It is an abundant fission fragment, and before because of that and that, it's a good indicator of radioactive releases in reactor accidents. It is an easy target because it is not obstructed by the background. Now, before we go further, I would like to make this uh, uh, statement here, and the statement is that nuclear science provides access to some, some, some of the most sensitive and non-destructive measurement techniques, and this is the reason nuclear sciences are used in life sciences, before you, you're using a PET scan and you're using MRI and other devices in your medicine. Now, if you consider 10 becker per liter activity of IL-131, which was uh, an average uh, activity, or, or let's say the activity measured at SFU on March 19, this corresponds to 10 to the 7th particles, so this is 10 million particles of IL-131 per liter of water. One liter of water is 55.6 mole, or 3.3 times 10 to the 25th molecules. If you take the ratio, tells you that we are sensitive to 10 to the 7th parts per 3.3 times 10 to the 25th, or one part per 3.3 times 10 to the, to, to the 18, which means 3.3 times billion times billion we see. All right? And that's why we've seen IL-131 from Fukushima. What we look for is the characteristic radiation in gamma ray spectrum, and these are patterns which we can 
recognized. And this is a, a, an example of a signal. Blue is cesium-137, red is cobalt-60. You see the difference between blue and red. We can measure the patterns and we can identify the isotopes based on the pattern, patterns. We can identify the type of the isotope and we can quantify the amount of the isotope from this measurement. To do this, you need a sophisticated detection system. Okay, this is a detect well, let's say maybe my colleague will take it as an overstatement, or my colleague is not sophisticated. But let's say you need to have more than a Geiger counter. This is an this is the uh, system which we have at SFU. It consists of a detector. The detector is cooled by liquid nitrogen. The detector sits in this shield. This is the lead shield which screens the detector from environmental natural radiation, which allows us to see. I am 31. This is the computer which runs the analysis. Now, the shield is crucial. Okay, for measurements in DC, the shield is crucial. If you measure without the shield, you see red. Red is the radiation which you are um, receiving from the background when you are look, uh, looking at the slide and listening to my talk. That's the uh, average BC background uh, uh, measured to sound radio. Okay, so this is what you're getting right now. If you use the shield, you see blue. And what you can see is that this is the counts per channel in logarithmic scale. Uh, and it, it shows you that we suppress the background by more than uh, 100, by a factor of 100. So this is another feature of shield. This is lead, this is copper and cadmium. This is the detector signal. in the shield. This is the signal which we've seen. This is the spectrum of gamma rays you've seen on March 18th. This is the spectrum of gamma rays seen on March 20th. This is the spectrum of gamma rays uh, seen on March 29th. This is the signal from IRM 131. It is not present on March 13th. It is still March 18th. It is present on March 20th clearly and it fades away on March 29th. We can analyze the speed and its intensity and we can quantify it. This is the time profile which we measure. As in the rainwater, this is a specific activity in the rainwater. You can see no signal here. The, the, the accident is here. This is when we start measuring. You get an increase up to, let's say, if you want to take the upper end of the error bar, 16 becquerels per liter, decays down and goes to zero um, in the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, April time. So we increase our signal because the signal in water was weak. We use bioaccumulation by seaweed. We collect the seaweed samples, we crush the samples, we reduce the volume, and we measure the samples. This is the signal in sucking seaweed taken from North Vancouver. This is taken on March 15th. No, no uh, sign of IRM-131. This is taken on March 22nd, clear signal of IRM-131. This is the specific activity in becquerels per kilogram. In seaweed, we have two, two, two sampling stations. One was North Vancouver in red, the other in Blumfield, uh, our science center in blue. Um, you can uh, see the IM-131 in rainwater and uh, two seaweed samples, so we clearly can identify that as signal for fishing. This is the overlap of the time profile in water with the time profile in seaweed. You can see the effect of bioaccumulation. Rainwater fades away quicker. Uh, seaweed accumulates and uh, decays later. All right, comparison to natural background radiation. So let's compare 16 becquerels per liter in the BC rainwater with natural sources of radioactivity. Living tissue com com contains 230 becquerels per kilogram of radioactive cosmogenic carbon-14. Since tissue is mostly water, this is 200 becquerels per liter. You can multiply by your mass, then you will get the number of becquerels per your body, and then you can compare this. So per liter of tissue, you have more carbon-14 by a factor of 10 than we would detect in the rain. Rate of the 22 concentration in ground, ground, ground water is on the level of 5 to 300 becquerels per liter. Near uranium rich deposits can reach 1,000 becquerels per liter. Milk contains 50 becquerels per liter of potassium 40. Tap water usually contains 1 becquerel per liter of radium to 22. Rain water typically contains 0.3 to 5 becquerels per liter of tritium, uh, of tritium or hydrogen 3. 
coal contains four to three hundred becquerels per kilogram at the activity of uranium and its daughters. If you do a calculation, one GeV coal burning power plant releases typically two hundred becquerels of radon to twenty two per second. Per second. Natural becquerel radiation again, food. Let's take 400 becquerels per kilogram activity. This is top, this is highest, high, high, higher limit of what we've seen. Iron 131, if you see dried seaweed with natural sources of radioactivity in food. Bananas contain 15 becquerels of potassium 40 per banana. Brazilian nuts, 200 to 400 becquerels per kilogram of potassium 40. Lima beans, 170 becquerels per kilogram of potassium 40. Vegetable, 125 becquerels per kilogram of potassium 40. Red meat, 100 becquerels per kilogram of potassium 40. Brazilian nuts, 40 to, 100, 40 to 260 becquerels per kilogram of radium to 26. You can take the 400 becquerels per kilogram activity of iron 131, which we measured in seaweed after Fukushima and compared to what has been measured in Vancouver in seaweed after the Chernobyl. And this is the paper, you can look it up. And that's also a measurement of INI 141 in seaweed, in Fukushima seaweed after the Chernobyl incident, also done by SFU. This is the curve which they measured, the, the, the daytime profile. This is in slightly different unit. They use becquerel per gram. 400 becquerels per kilogram corresponds to 0.4 becquerels per gram. So specific activities of iron 131 in BC seaweed after the Chernobyl accident peaked at 4 becquerels per kg per gram. This means that the radiation levels in BC after the Chernobyl accident were 10 times higher than following the uh, Fukushima accident. And there is no assumption here, this is pure data. Okay. Comparison to radiological radio medical doses, uh, IR131 is administered for medical diagnostics in the range of million becquerel per procedure. So this is a mega becquerel for diagnostics. Uh, 10 becquerel, the amount of rainwater, so if you take the, uh, 10 becquerel per liter, the amount of rainwater containing this dose is 100,000 liters or 100 ton. All right? So you need to filter out 100 ton of water, rainwater, to get the medical dose for diagnosis. The medical dose for cancer therapy of thyroid is in the range of million becquerel at 10 becquerel per liter. This is 100,000 tons of water. Other comparisons can be made. We have the discussion already. It needs to converge to the dose, and the dose consensus. I think that we are not going there. If you take other measurements, other measurements were done also at Triumph, for example. Triumph measured rain, uh, rainwater and milk samples and checked the bottom water for free Fukushima control sample. Detection limit was 0.9, 0.09 kg per liter. There was no result. The rainwater on April 3rd, the third fourth was 0.4 becquerel per, per liter per liter per liter. Milk was tested, no iron 131 was detected, potassium was detected. This is it, this is available, this is available at the website. I should, before I start, I should give credit to my collaborators, which is uh, graduate students at SFU, uh, current candidate from physics for something gathering from North Vancouver, Banfield Marine Science Center for um, Sampling in, uh, on Vancouver Island, other students <coughs> in Salomon, and financial support for the radiation safety that has appeared. And here are my concluding slides, and I think I'll finish here. Thank you. So we have time for uh, questions. Can you repeat the question? I don't know what you're asking for. Yes. 
I know, just, I, I, I know the big city. Sure. So <laughs> I, um, I used to be, and now I'm frightened to, and I wondered if it's your uh, if it's your interpretation of the data that I should be, and whether I should be frightened of seaweed from here and or from Japan. Thank you. I, I would not, I would like to refrain from uh, altering your seaweed eating habits, substantially. I think that it's, it's a personal decision. I showed you the data. You can look at the data and make your decision. Do you have data on anything? Okay. I was wondering who uses your data. Is it the classified level I think that my main concern, this data was this data was publicly available and the data has been misused in all possible ways you can think about. It was this data shows essentially no impact on the environment uh, because of the comparison which I was showing you. This data was used to uh, uh, in all kinds of, of, of uh, broadcasts and web publications, irresponsible, which were uh, essentially targeted in uh, increasing the fear level. And that was really unfortunate. Hi, uh, I'm interested in whether you. Do I have a next? I, 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 can, I cannot. Can you raise your hand on the phone? Oh, yeah, I can see you. Uh, no, I see you. Where are you? Oh, okay. No, just raise your hand. Hi, um, Tom Buchanan from Seattle. I wondered, uh, in your discussions, when you first heard about uh, Fukushima and, and the uh, catastrophe, were you considering other noble gases, uh, cesium? Did you have discussions about, I'm, I'm impressed with what you've studied, but I'm wondering what else did you uh, discuss and um, Either could not do or on so on. Uh, so you need to you need to recognize that the critical thing in radiation monitor is something, right? It's not it's it's not as much as measurement techniques. Techniques are available. It's something. And the first thing is that if, if you want to have a credible result, you have to sample in a credible way. To sample in a credible way, you have to have the means to sample. If you want to sample novel, novel gases, you have to have an infrastructure which is set up for sampling. You have to have air filters. We are, we are set up for gamma ray spectroscopy because of our research. And the fact that we were set up for gamma ray spectroscopy allowed us to pick up the IMM-131, which is a gamma emitter. Okay? It's not only a beta emitter, as it was said, it's also a gamma emitter. All right? So we could see that. Now, we are a university research lab which is not responsible for monitoring the radiation levels. We were not set up for doing this kind of sampling. Uh, I think that one, one of the problems which you need to recognize is that sampling is monitoring and sampling is expensive. And there's a lot of talk about we should do this, we should do that, we should monitor this, we should monitor that. It is very expensive and for most of the time, you see nothing, all right? So, the, what, so what, what is going to happen, in my, my prediction is, that there will be an increased level of monitoring because the memory of Fukushima is so high, which will fade away because monitoring nothing, you need to have a lot of dedication to monitor nothing for a long time, all right? So it will go away. There are agencies which are responsible for monitoring, and they, they have a mandate to do that, and uh, let's hope that they will you know, continue and then they will do a good job on the uh, monitoring. Uh, just, just a question about background radiation. Yeah. Um, do you look at the background radiation um, rates over time in terms of decades? Because is it not the case now that background radiation is higher from cell phone use technology, smart meters? Uh, I mean, don't bring the smart meters to the discussion because it's a complete misunderstanding. Okay, and, but uh, the, 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 the answer for the real question is a lot of questions that we talk about nuclear radiation or nuclear radiation. Um, 
the, uh, this something is available, for example, if you have historical artifacts which you can identify the original, so you can pick up, let's say, museum samples of clay or things like that and look at that. And, and uh, the, uh, the man-made isotopes have very well-defined uh, signatures. An increase in background radiation from magnetic isotopes is easily available, it's easily recognizable. So, cesium 137 has a line in C61. You take a sample from pre 1930s, pre 1930s, you will not see 661, right? You just take the current sample, you will take C61 from the uh, weather test. And I think that the most challenge, if I can comment about cesium, the most challenge in, in sampling cesium uh, from Fukushima will be the, the making the distinction between um, cesium coming from Fukushima and cesium coming from the weapon test. I think that we were not able to uh, conclusively identify the increase of cesium 137, 61 line, on the top of the peak which we see from the nuclear weapon. I, I didn't monitor over the last second. There is one more person. There's a person who actually is lined up for questions. Yes. You chose a high line, which is not that it is only expected to be in the fire. If we measure other isotopes together, we don't have that. Can we actually see bio accumulation? Would I see, so let's say, let me repeat your question. Would I see bio accumulation of long lived isotopes in C. Right. We have not seen that. Okay? We we compare the seaweed from pre Fukushima with the seaweed of uh, post Fukushima, the only thing we could see was iron one twenty one. We couldn't see anything else. It doesn't mean it's not there, it means that it's below our detection level. But if it's below our detection level, it tells us how much of it that there is and that there is a little. So you actually measure cesium 137? I can't, I, I just said that. I can measure cesium. I don't know how much cesium comes from Fukushima, how much yeah. cesium comes from the bomb. So you don't have a reference frame? Say that? You don't have a reference frame? Reference frame. You don't have a reference frame. Do they have a reference frame? So the, are you saying that, uh, okay, I don't have seaweed which is older than the nuclear test, nuclear weapon test. I would have to have access to seaweed from before 1940s, and I don't have an access to the seaweed like that. Every seaweed which was taken after nuclear weapon test would have seen what they from nuclear weapon tests. Okay? Thank you. No, no. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's, we have to yeah, call the questions to, to an end. But you can see the challenge. There's an enormous challenge to our nuclear scientists to educate the public about the increasing concerns that we have and to understand, as Dr. Chris Starsowski mentioned, how much, uh, what kinds of radiation can be measured and what we can expect from them. And I'm, so I'm sorry to have off the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Something different or something more uh, uh, 
professionally polished uh, by three ghosts. Um, and as a journalist, my job is to try and tell complicated stories, relate complicated events, and complicated scientific issues um, in uh, ordinary language, because it's, it's a, a, a extremely important for all information to be democratized. So I'm going to refrain from uh, technical jargon for the most part, and um, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, that's a good way to do it. So every week, millions of people in North America turn into their favorite crime show called CSI. In each episode, intrepid investigators have one hour, minus commercial time, to discover and capture the outlaw. Often, the only clues are fingerprints found at the crime scene. Ten uniquely, uh, uh, unique, potentially incriminating signatures, just like the ones on our fingertips. It's a tough job, but miraculously, those CSI clues always beat the odds and the clock. Now, imagine one year after three reactor core meltdowns at Fukushima, that the outlaws to track are not human lowlifes, but uh, escaped radionuclides, some with half-lives that extend for centuries, even epochs. This is where the dimensions of humanity's dance with the deadly atom and the impossibility of closing this crime case hit home. Let's start with a condensed summary of the physics and biology, as if we were guest detectives on CSI. Much to our deep chagrin, we find, one, the crimes are still in progress. Despite claims of full <coughs> shutdown, te uh, to 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 Tokyo Electric Power Company does not know the fate of the molten cores at units one, two, or three, or he even how to inspect these. That means the accident is not over, and may not be for years. Meanwhile, the radiation is still escaping into nearby air and water, and radioactive garbage is accumulating. And no one knows how or where to dispose of the three molten cores, or the 10 reactors worth of uh, uh, spent fuel at the Fukushima site, or if they can even be retrieved. Two, instead of one outlaw with a single set of fingerprints to track, the Fukushima reactors each created more than 200 distinctly different but deadly fission products as part of their normal operations. There's a comparable list of, of fission signatures or fragments in Kandu uh, used reactor fuel. Every civilian reactor of any make, model, country of origin, or location creates a similar radioactive inventory. Um, can we have the other slide as well? Thanks. Um, your slide, by the way, is just a bit low. Right. We'll bring that one back. By the by. <laughs> and just scroll down. Okay, um, so these, here's the list, and I'll just uh, go through this briefly, just to give you the idea. This is the list of um, radioactive fragments um, or uh, transuranic elements that are in can be uh, used reactor fuel. There's a, there's a roughly uh, comparable list from all used reactor fuel, including at Fukushima. So these are all the radioactive uh, byproducts also that Kathy mentioned this morning. So there's 211 of them. So these 200, 211 submolecular transuranic outlaws are invisible, tasteless, and odorless. So they can escape without being discovered by a single ordinary human witness. Only those with radiation equipment can trace their escape route long after the fact. And often, as at Fukushima, those who initially hold the radiation detection um, equipment either doesn't work or they lie about the results. Next, like drones or cruise missiles, these radioactive elements hone in on specific targets in animals and humans, but they infiltrate our defenses by mimicking chemicals and trace elements we need to absorb to survive. So they are diabolical masters of disguise. Instead of going for a no single knockout blow, they choose multiple targets in the body, such as teeth, bones, muscle tissue, and re reproductive organs. This increases the chances of deadly success. Next, because they constantly emit subatomic powerful bursts of energy, they act as time-lapse time cluster bombs inside bodies, per perpetually ejecting deadly fragments of energy that damage or destroy adjacent cells, as Kathy's slide showed this morning. Some of the most invidious outlaws, such as plutonium, seek to invade, invade and occupy reproductive organs. 
These can then cause damage to current generations of male and female animals and humans. Worse, because women of childbearing age have a single lifetime stock of ova, renegade radionuclides can damage those cells and genes, those cells and genes, I'm sorry, I've lost a little bit of my speech here. Uh, next, all these uh, 211 radio radiological outlaws have innate embedded properties that make them uniquely, diabolically deadly. Like pathological criminals, they are programmed to keep killing and damaging living cells of animals and humans. Like criminal gangs, they are programmed to bioaccumulate bio in plants, fish, insects, reptiles, birds, mollusks, mammals, and humans, so that the prospects for cell damage and destruction magnify in each species, and then, multi and, and then in multiple species throughout the food chain. The radioactive half-life natures mean some cellular damage uh, uh, crime sprees will last only for hours or days, but many will keep killing or maiming exposed cells for centuries. The outlaws can strike as alpha, beta, or gamma emitters, and sometimes as, as uh, combinations. So a triple defense system, or three kinds of biological protective shielding, are needed for all exposed cells. It is one thing to defend an, an assault of tanks, it is another to also need supersonic jets and battleships. Um, and as Kathy mentioned this morning, particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to the cell damage are women of child-bearing uh, age uh, because the cells, damaged cells can cause genetic damage to, to children and possibly future generations, putting the human gene pool at risk. Also particularly vulnerable to attack of children because radio nucleus readily attacks cells that they are so to return to the CSI analogy, health professionals confronted with new Fukushima radiation releases are not facing the task of finding a single criminal who had a perceived motive but may never commit another crime, may be captured, or may suffer remorse and turn himself in. Instead, the task is to track, without real-time witnesses, 211 shape-shifting masters of disguise which have no conscience whatsoever, which target women and children first, which invade and occupy organs by mimicking exactly what vital, vital chemicals they need and can, put, and can put the gene pool of any or many species at risk. If these radionuclides were people, they would be condemned as permanent psychopaths. And as if that were not uh, alarming enough, we now turn to the global volume of radionuclides already poised to do more malevolent damage. There are some 440 operating civilian nuclear reactors in the world. Each has a deadly inventory similar to that of Fukushima, or the follow-up from several dozen atomic bomb tests. Each will produce spent fuel waste embedding this inventory of 211 radioactive outlaws. But there is nowhere on Earth where there is a proven, safe, publicly accepted method or location for disposing of the latently lethal wastes from these 440 reactors. In my view, the physics and biology tell us that radioactive outlaws can never be caught until far too late. Their crimes can never be solved. Um, the 211 radioactive fugitives never captured. The task is impossible, even for CFI. Therefore, while important, the key issue for us is not optimal radiation monitoring. It is about how to stop new reactors from being built and more uranium. Equally importantly, it is, about, it is about adopting green power technologies and smart energy use so that nuclear power plants become irrelevant. Before I get to the good news, and there is very good news, I want to spend a few minutes summarizing the second spectral a aspect of global nuclear commerce from a Canadian culpability point of view. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a group of leading American physicists who had helped build the first atomic bombs and knew the secrets that they had stolen from nature could be inevitably re replicated. They pleaded with US Presidents Truman and Eisenhower to prevent an atomic arms race by first and foremost putting all uranium mining under strict international control. They understood that this was the key choke point for preventing prol proliferation and that allowing uranium to be traded like wheat, steel, farm tractors, or lumber in global commerce would be the worst thing that could, be, could happen. So here's why. It took a grapefruit-sized sphere of uranium-235 to destroy Hiroshima. It took a plum-sized sphere of plutonium to destroy Nagasaki. 
But all of the fish and uh, fissile material in these uh, two, first two bombs did, did not uh, detonate. In fact, only an amount of fish and fissile material about this size uh, was needed to destroy two cities. So when you take this scale of destruction possible from these cores of fissile material, Consider, so it takes about 20 kilograms of uh, uranium-235 to make a, an atomic weapon. It takes about 80 kilograms of plutonium to make an atomic bomb. Yet, <clears throat> every metric ton of uranium contains seven grams of uranium-235. So every three tons has enough uranium-235 <laughs> in it to uh, build an atomic, uh, uh, an atomic bomb. And every ton of uranium-235 that gets burned up in a typical reactor, whether it's a can Canadian reactor or one at Fukushima or one in, in Russia or one in India or China, produces about two and a half kilograms of plutonium. So you need uh, four tons of uranium to uh, be transmuted into one, kilo uh, one uh, atomic bomb's worth of plutonium. So I know these are a lot of numbers, and I'd be happy to, to uh, uh, give a copy and you can look these up later. Uh, so I want to contrast this amount of uranium with the amount that Canada is exporting every year, which is 7.3 million tons. Embedded in these exports is enough uranium-235 atoms to make 2,600 atomic bombs per year. If it is burned in reactors, as Canadian uranium was at Fukushima, some 19,000 kilograms of plutonium will reside in the spent fuel. That's enough to make 2,300 plutonium bombs per year. So while President Obama is laudably leading global efforts to cut nuclear war, Cold War nuclear weapon stockpiles, each year Canada is exporting the very outlaw elements which can be, can be converted into some 5,000 atomic weapons. Last month, our Prime Minister was in China shamelessly flogging uranium and candy reactors to a communist regime which during the last three decades has covertly supplied nuclear weapons technology, expertise, and crucial ingredients to North Korea, Pakistan, the infamous nuclear Walmart network of rogue, rogue scientists AQ Khan, to enter Iran and Libya. China has refused to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty and it has refused to sign the pending UN-sponsored Com Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So has India, Canada's other leading target for uranium and reactor sales, which in 1974 used a peaceful can reactor to make plutonium for its first atomic bomb. Now it has 100 weapons of mass destruction, including hydrogen bombs. Its arch rival, Pakistan, has a similar arsenal. Stephen Harper has also quietly agreed to delete or weaken wet porous protocols now exist in our bilateral nuclear treaties. This is not only the height of recklessness with weapon states like China, India, and Pakistan, but even worse, completely undercuts global efforts to strengthen of proliferation regimes. This is happening in part because the Fukushima accident has blown a gaping hole in the nuclear renaissance. Globally, only two reactors started construction last year. Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Belgium, and many other countries have vetoed any new, any new nuclear reactors ever. This leaves companies like Canada's uranium producer, Cameco, and the French giant, Ariba, with slashed uranium orders and the share prices big debt burdens, and lots of uranium properties they can't unload. Cameco's share price, and Cameco is a Canadian company with the largest uh, producer of uranium in the world. Their, their stock <coughs> share price has fallen from $67 in 2007 to less than $24. In the same period, uranium prices fell from $140 per pound to $52, $52 per pound. In short, the nuclear industry is desperate. And desperate players usually turn to their governments to help grease more sales, give deeper subsidies, and cut environmental labor safety or other costs like non-proliferation safeguards. So I urge everyone here to keep their eye on that very dangerous, very dangerous shell game. Last but not least, I want to share some uplifting evidence that there is a path out of this commerce without conscience. I want to include this for three reasons. One, because we have reached now the cusp where green power is, technically, is a technically and financially viable replacement for the 13% of world electricity now supplied by nuclear plants. <coughs> Two, because the nuclear nexus of corporations, scientists, government bureaucracies, and unions 
which have brought us atomic theocracies, such as that in Japan, are marshaling a counterattack to preserve their discredited empires. For, and three, for morale. Like those health professionals working to prevent pandemics, we need to see and believe that the equivalent of antiviral vaccines are ready to deploy. Green power and energy efficiency are our, our antidote. This is the basis for real sustaining hope. For economic, environmental, and ethical reasons, I am certain the global advent of green power is as, as inevitable as the internet vaulting the Great Wall of China or the take up of, Latin, of cell phones in the poorest areas of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Only a decade ago, those were unthinkable or available and affordable for only a few. But their intrinsic utility and low cost driven by mass production changed all that. Despite an often despotic government, digital de democracy in China is now unstoppable. And farmers in rural Kenya or street stall vendors in J Jakarta often have better, cheaper cell phone service than I do in rural Ontario. <laughs> Thrillingly, the same dynamic is now played uh, with green power technologies. Worldwide investments are on a steep incline. The price per watt for solar panels has decreased 70% since 2008, and wind costs per watt have fallen 20% due to design innovation, better production processes, and lower material usage and costs. Just as smartphones served as the spark for countless ingenious ways to revolutionize social networks and business, and even for actual revolutions such as the recent Arab Spring uprisings, the green power sector is underpinning the development of complementary smart grid power storage and interactive grid transfer technologies. Here, efficiency, economics, and, and economics and scale are imminent key drivers. Ironically, it will be rising gasoline prices and the electric car which serves as the tipping point. Here's why. Recharged electric engines can get people from point A to point B at one-fifth the fuel cost of gasoline engines. A new electric vehicle can go 24,000 kilometers for less than $500 on grid charge power. A comparably sized new gas powered car will cost $2,100 to go the same distance. That $1,600 uh, fuel saving can be used to entirely pay off a typical annual household bill. So, by simply switching from a gas to an electric vehicle, a citizen can cut their annual mobility cost to $500 and effectively get a year's worth of household electric power for free. Why? Because electric motors deliver power to car wheels five times more efficiently than gasoline motors. This is an example of an efficiency dividend, but there is even better news. There are already more than 220 million cars in North America which collectively hold 30 times more power in their batteries than the combined peak out power output of all the continent's power plants. These vehicles are idle on average 80% of every day. So here's what's coming here, but also in Japan, Europe, China, India, and Brazil. The 20th century grid model, which saw electrons flow only one way from giant, expensive, and often dangerous power plants, will be replaced by an interactive two-way electron flow, which reacts in milliseconds to regional demand and supply choices. Much of that power will be stored in and dispensed from millions of vehicle batteries as they sit idle in garages, working, workplace parking lots, and shopping malls. <coughs> These batteries will act just like uh, bank cards, depositing and withdrawing electrons instead of cash. You will get a statement at the end of the month calculating your net electron balance and your costs for charging and selling based on off-peak and on-peak rates. You will be your own mobile utility. This imminent game-changing combination of economics, technology, and scale explains why billions of dollars in smart investment capital around the world is increasingly heading for green power projects, grid storage technology, <coughs> battery development, and electrical vehicle uh, production. Um, this is why uh, non-oil or non-utility giants like General Electric, Siemens, Samsung, Sharp, Toshiba, and India's Tata conglomerate have got into the game in a big way. Uh, and why companies like Ford and SunPower have formed a joint venture to sell both electric cars and solar panels to power them from the same showrooms across the continent. Based on these trends, pardon me, in the fourth quarter of 2000 alone, investments in global green power projects were up 16% to $42 billion. So that's $200 billion per year. Recently, German banks announced $130 billion in support for green power and smart grid projects for the next five years. Based on these trends, 
Even that notorious socialist outfit known as Goldman Sachs has forecast that within three years, green power parks will reach cost parity with new U.S. coal plants. Mass-produced electric vehicles will be right behind. The interactive grid will be right behind those. This is a bounty. This bounty is the is the antithesis of the threat that nuclear fission and its 211 radioactive outlaws offers. Green power represents a real renaissance. It is the safest, fastest, surest path to a green and prosperous future. Thank you. Are there questions for yes. Paul? Uh, yes. Our microphone. Right here. Right here. Right here. Would you raise your hand again? I have a question for Eric Bertoni. I know we're going to talk about the little iodine. We don't have to worry about the iodine, obviously, because it was hardly detectable. Regarding the plutonium, the consolidated thing, could you? See from plutonium how toxic it is at all. We have some research on that that you can mention to the public. Because the thing that I like to <coughs> refer to is from Dr. Helen Kalikov and other scientists that said the same thing. If you take a, a dollar bill or any tiny piece of money and you were to divide it up into a million pieces, that's a millionth of a gram. That's how much material it takes to fill a person with plutonium. Um, well, uh, not much more needs to be said. It's one of the hellish, most hellish things that has ever been created by human beings. It's uh, it's not only uh, dangerous as a as a radionuclide. It's it's extremely dangerous, um, uh, but it's also extremely toxic. So um, it uh, and uh, it's uh, easily airborne in an explosion. Um, uh, it's uh, it's about as hellish a thing as. You can get, and it's also a fissile material, um, and you can make uh, nuclear weapons out of it. So that's as bad as it gets. Do you have something else? I, uh, oh. Yeah. And the guess it's half life is twenty. Uh, twenty four thousand years. Twenty four thousand years. So times ten, which is only what we do with these things, you multiply that by ten half lives. We're looking at a quarter of a million years. Finland is the only country in the world that's building a long-term storage facility. It'll take them 100 years to build. I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, for anyone who's interested, they should look back into eternity. A very interesting documentary on this issue. Thanks. Let, let me let me answer that because I think that I I think there are many misconceptions that the ratio of plutonium to iodine can quantify. Knowing the ratio of iodine, you can recalculate the ratio of plutonium. If you have the data on iodine, you have the data on the ratio, you will have the answer. Okay? Which is a quantitative answer based on the data. You need to be careful when making the case. And if there is no case, you don't make it. Another question? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Paul, and uh, I appreciate very much that you have uh, provided us with some of the positive responses and um, possibilities, but what is going on in the real world as we speak? You mentioned there were only a couple of uranium uh, mine, uh, reactors that were built in the last little while. Most Sensible countries are staying away from them. But I know, I've noticed in the uh, business section of the newspapers in this past year that an awful lot of countries that border on the new petroleum uh, reserves, mostly underwater, but it also includes Alberta, are proposing the building of new um, reactors, you know, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam, China. Um, India, Iran, um, and England, and all that sort of thing, and um, they are, um, uh, I believe that what they're, they're very quite about this, but I believe what they're up to is value-adding petroleum because it's rising uh, value in the marketplace. Um, well, there's a big difference between uh, being proposed and actually being built. 
because uh, I think the general, the general, and Germany says this best, and one of their leading companies, Siemens, have both said they're not going to be involved in nuclear plants anymore. Um, and it may be for many of the wrong reasons, uh, but uh, capital is, is fleeing nuclear um, just about as fast as it possibly can. So, um, and it's, and India is a very good example because before Fukushima, it was either the leading or second leading proponent of nuclear power for the next 25 years with China. And both those countries in the last year have done, uh, have turned on a dime as far as uh, uh, renewables is concerned. And I'm talking about actual money being invested and projects being built. Um, the, the most exciting night, news I've heard in the last several months is just came recently for, uh, from India where they announced with great fan for the Solar Millennium project. But it was a very, very modest expectation that they had. They, they've gone way past their original announced expectation already uh, in the first year of 20. And they just had an option for new renewable project, uh, solar projects in a certain section of, um, of India. So 300 megawatts uh, could probably power um, every, every city and town in British Columbia except Vancouver, um, every, every residential center anyway. Um, it's a lot of power. They just put out a bid and asked uh, solar panel makers in India and China and the rest of the world to come and, and bid on these projects. They closed the bid and the winning bid was at 15 cents a kilowatt hour, which is about the retail cost of, of uh, electricity in California. So that tells us that just this year in 2012, they are going to be start building a, a, a large solar power plant in India um, at the cost of building new power plants or the residential retail price in, in California. So that's absolutely wonderful news. And eventually, Malaysia, uh, uh, Vietnam, all those countries that are considering nuclear will, will wake up to that and, uh, and we'll get a, a much a, a greener future a lot faster. I okay? We've had a scientist, we've had a journalist, and now we're going to have a public health uh, specialist here. We have Anne-Marie Nicole, who's an assistant professor from UBC in the School of Population and Public Health. She's also director of Carrick's Can Cancer Monitoring Program and Risk Communication Expert. Anne-Marie. Hello. I'm here today in part because I have two very different hats. My first hat is my interest in risk communication, but it's not the thing that pays the bills. Um, I am an epidemiologist by training. So what's been interesting to me about Fukushima is that it is, in very many ways, an integration of my interest in how people communicate about risk and also the debate about what is a risk and who gets to set the agenda for what is a risk. So I'm going to talk a bit about risk communication and then I'm going to talk at the end very quickly about some of the work that we're doing on carcinogen surveillance in Canada. So just to start, I want to orient you to the concept of what is risk communication. And the WHO says that risk communication is the interactive process, thank you, or an exchange of information. Um, but what happened in Fukushima really isn't risk communication, it's actually crisis communication. And that's a very particular kind of communication that happens when there is a disaster of some kind, when events have to be communicated quickly and clearly to people who are affected and then the world beyond. So what's interesting about risk communication is that the concept has been, uh, since people tried to cite nuclear power plants in the 1970s, what governments realized very quickly was that nobody really wanted to talk about the technical aspects of risk. It's the emotive or emotional parts of risk that actually lead to the biggest concern in the public. And that ignoring that emotional aspect is what actually leads to a great deal of problems with trying to uh, convey statistics or data to people. They, they need to have their emotions addressed before you need to talk to them about um, parts of the and things like that. And th these are lessons that were learned particularly around radiation and radiation safety in the 1980s um, by the EPA. So we've actually been studying this area as risk communication scientists for quite a long time. 
And I'm going to draw on the work here of Dr. Peter Sandman, who's a seminal research communicator, a risk communication researcher in the United States, and I've had the uh, opportunity to work with him, so I am going to be paraphrasing him quite thoroughly for the presentation. So Dr. Sandman gives a quadrant of different communication scenarios, and you can see here that in Japan, crisis communication was the foremost issue, but what we had here, I believe, in Canada is something called outreach management. Because in Japan, the hazard was very high. In Canada, we had less hazard, or what we could call low hazard. But we still had a lot of outrage. And this isn't necessarily surprising. Having a nuclear reactor meltdown is a very upsetting and outrageous thing to have happen. So when I say a high outrage, I'm not saying this in a pejorative sense, I'm just saying that emotions were running high, and recognizing that these are very different from the other kinds of risk communication strategies that governments often employ, which is predominantly this kind of education strategy, where you basically just present the facts and hope people will digest them and think about things and make choices. But in reality, I believe that what was happening at least here in British Columbia was this quadrant. And there's also many other things that we've experienced even in the last year that uh, also have that kind of quadrant going on, looking at the pandemic influenza outbreak that we had, different chemical spills and reactor meltdowns, even uh, world trade, uh, the global financial meltdowns also could be organized into those types of quadrants. So this is not unique to radiation. I just wanted to point out that other communication issues also fall into these quadrants. <coughs> So the main goal of crisis communication is to break down information into three specific areas. What happened? And we saw that in Fukushima. People were talking in the news about you know, exactly what happened. There was a tsunami and then a reactor went down. And, and you know, the details were kind of sketchy, but nobody really knew what happened right off the bat. So that's very normal. Um, the things that were kind of missing and what's led overall, I think, to the dissatisfaction around the messages coming out of Fukushima is that there was very little information about what was going to happen next and um, what the worst case scenario was. And this is one of Peter Sandman's holy grails, is that if you're not talking about worst case scenarios, you're not doing a very good job of communicating. And I'll show you a few examples of that as we go along. So there was also not very much information about how prepared people should be, particularly here in the West Coast. It's not a crazy idea that radiation was going to reach these shores. In fact, anybody with some education in the area of radiation knows that radiation builds up in food and it travels. So the idea that it was going to show up here was completely rational and sensical. But it, the government communication about that never really acknowledged that people could be concerned and what the public could do or should do. And I'll also give you a slide about that in a moment. So one of the things that struck me as the news coverage came along, and I'm actually right in the middle of doing a project where I'm uh, critically analyzing all the different news stories, particularly about British Columbia, but also origin in Japan. So how, how did the news trajectory follow what happened? And um, what I found was that there was great concern about people panicking. And nowhere in any of the news coverage did I see what I construed as people panicking. There were people trampling over other people. There were sort of people shooting people because of shortages of food. There were just people doing what I thought were very rational things. They were stocking up on food and water. And anyone who's ever taken part in earthquake safety or training in safety knows that those are exactly the types of things that you're supposed to do. You get a kit that says stock up on food and water, you may need it for two weeks. So our government suggests we do this, and then as soon as people start stocking up on food and water, you're accused of panicking, which to me seemed like a, a very, um, it was a schism in the messages that were coming out. And also the idea that people wanted to purchase potassium iodide, and then that was construed as a panic, also to me seemed unreasonable. People wanted to do something about what was going on. And one of the very few things that they saw that they could do was actually purchase potassium iodide. And it, uh, well, that does have some potential health effects if people take it and they're not supposed to. Just the very fact that people were out there trying to do something about what they thought might be a risk, again, seems very rational human behavior. And I think that this, in many ways, should have been a big red flag for people here in the government and, and people in the, in the media that people wanted to do something about the risk, that they were engaged and mobilized in this issue. And here was an excellent opportunity to start talking to people and addressing their concerns empathetically, but this didn't happen. 
I just wanted to show you some of the articles that I'm looking at. I really do want to um, examine also the sort of lack of empathy that came along. So the overarching information that I'm seeing in my analysis, a lot of emphasis on facts and a lot of emphasis on it's going to be okay without any sense of what could be wrong, what could happen, and what people could do. So we, we did have a lot of and for example, some of the critiques that came in out of this article when it was published was, these are some of the comments, and you can see already that people are, are very suspicious about this, you shouldn't be doing these things. They're suggesting that it's okay for medical professionals to tell you not to get iodine because they already got it, and that if there was a problem, then you would be prepared. And I think that's probably true. If there had been suddenly something terrible that required people to buy these pills, um, if you waited and everyone tried to buy them at once, that would be a panic. So the idea that people were going ahead of time and trying to be prepared again, I think, is very normal for the behavior. So some of the things that Sandman suggests that people should do in crisis communication is recognize that audiences are going to be upset. And, and things like nuclear power and nuclear meltdowns, we have a cultural history with these, and these are very emotive issues that do cause people to become very upset very quickly. And you should never, ever over-assure people that things are going to be okay, especially when you don't know. And I think, that, again, this is one of the things that struck me very clearly, is I was glued to the internet. I had about four different news scenes coming in, watching, because we really didn't know what was going to happen. We weren't being provided with information. There was confusion among the governments. This is a, a global issue that's being done in a country where the concept of transparency and communication was very poor. So you should never ever say no risk. And if there is anybody in here, whoever has to communicate to the public, please take this message with you. Because you should never say that because you're always going to end up with egg in your face eventually. And if, this, and if you do, if somehow somebody finds a smidgen of something that is a risk, you're going to lose your credibility. And it's never worth it. It's never worth it to take that risk. So you should always say things instead like, the risk is low. Or we don't, while well, we see the presence of radionuclear ties, we don't expect they'll have an appreciable increase on people's health risks. So I just wanted to show you some of the press releases that were coming out of Japan at the time. This was from TEPCO. There's a lot of data, there's not a lot of empathy. Uh, this is a no risk article. No, we, this is not like Chernobyl, but again, this turned out to not be true. We ended up having the same rating with Fukushima as Chernobyl. And there was a small attempt by the CDC to try to engage people's anxiety and reactions. And I think that that's one of the things the press can do during a crisis is be that entity that helps. Uh, collect and even assuage people's fears. And what I, I believe is happening is that I haven't watched the television articles yet, uh, the TV coverage, but it's possible that just because the news media wasn't showing emotive or concern for anxiety, I think that television coverage may have shown a bit more of that government empathy, but I'm, I'm not counting on it. And this is just what happens when you say there is no risk. This was Dalton McGinty coming under fire um, for some of the things that he said. Fukushima. And also we're learning now more and more that the Japanese government did have data, and so if they're denying they had any data or they had no information, it's really destroying the credibility of the Japanese government in the eyes of the world. And I'm not sure that this was, a, this was an ill-informed approach on their part. So some of the things that you should also should and shouldn't do is the legitimation, legitimization of fears. And in my analysis, I'm going to be going through articles to see if they did legitimize people's fears. Um, don't ridicule people. Don't accuse people of panicking. We did see governments suggesting that, particularly here in North America, people may have been panicking on the West Coast. And that governments need to recognize that people are allowed to be upset about things that happen, particularly around environmental risks that are rare or catastrophic. And again, this, this sentiment was never really addressed by our local governments. I'm just, I know I don't have a lot of time because it's lunch time, so I'm going to skip over this. But I did want to indicate that Fukushima and just radiation in general, one of the big things that it had is well-known issues that make it more upsetting. So depending on what your, the characteristics of a risk, each risk situation has its own intrinsic characteristics that make people naturally more or less upset about it. These are called psychometric paradigms or psychometric factors. 
And so the things that are untrustworthy and have few benefits, and I've left those off because I'm not sure how untrustworthy the Japanese government was before this situation happened. But we know that in this case, it was involuntary exposure, it's not controllable, it's unfair and inequitable. We were not benefiting from the nuclear power in Japan. This is a man-made disaster with exotic radium that we don't understand. It causes cancer, it was dreaded, we didn't know what was going to happen, and there were children and victims. So this risk had all the things that make it very, very upsetting. And again, this, this whole paradigm was developed in the 1970s in the United States. We've known this for a very long time. So why the risk communicators weren't paying attention to what we already knew and using this to craft the messages to the public uh, seems very strange to me. The other thing that contributes to our concern around nuclear things is that we've had a bad history of um, nuclear meltdowns, nuclear bombs, and nuclear disasters in the world. And so it captures a global sentiment of concern, which actually exacerbates a lot of the things that happen in here. So we're all highly culturally sensitized to be upset about radiation, so it's normal that we become upset about it, regardless of how logical facts can be regarding the exposure or not. So just to, I'm going to end on this point of worst case scenarios, in part because what we know more about risk communication is what's called the risk communication seesaw effect. So the reason why you want to talk about worst case scenarios is because if you say it's your fault, people tend to go, oh, it's not really your fault. It's kind of my fault too. But if you say it's not my fault, then people go to that other side. The more you talk about one side of an issue, the more listeners and audiences orient to the other side. So the more you say it's safe, it's safe, it's fine, the more people are actually going to believe that it's not safe and it's not fine. It's actually a very detrimental approach to reassure the public about anything. So it, it also, if you emphasize that a catastrophe is possible, if the Japanese government had said, look, we don't know what's going to happen. This thing could melt down. All of these things could melt down. Audience would tend to say, well, that's probably just government overreacting, it's not going to melt down. And that actually is a very reassuring function. It brings people over to your side. And I know Sandman's had a very difficult road trying to convince people like GE and uh, big, in Monsanto that they need to be doing or riding this risk communication seesaw. And it's really hard to get people to actually talk about worst case scenarios or talk about themselves as being to blame. But, but the upside of doing those things is that it actually does really help decrease anxiety, and once you decrease anxiety, then you can talk about facts. So it's in everybody's best interest to get upsetness, anxiety, and fear control before you get into a rational dialogue about what's actually going on. And right now you can see now that we're, um, we're in the process of reconstructing what happened in Japan, and there's this discussion of the devil's chain nuclear reaction explosions and all the things that the government knew about but wasn't telling anybody. So this is, I think, really um, what happens when you don't talk about things is they eventually come out in the press and then you look bad. One other thing I think that the situation really suffered from, and this I think this was not avoidable at all, was the dueling experts problem because people weren't talking in Japan, experts started weighing in, and some of the few people that actually talked were people like Greenpeace, which I commend them for standing up and putting their scientists out there um, talking about things that the rest of the world wasn't willing to engage in. I am talking in the slot where Health Canada was supposed to have a representative, and I was going to talk about the media releases that they put out, but you can see very conveniently there are no Health Canada media releases pertaining to Fukushima at this moment in time. Um, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, but I found this kind of strange. So just to work, move to the other work that I do, um, I work in this area. This is radon. It's a uh, radioactive gas that, that, is, uh, that uh, exists across the country. This is a map of where the radioactive gas is in Canada in the soil. It's a soil gas. It creeps into people's homes and then becomes, it uh, builds up. Um, we know that it kills between 26 and 3,600 people a year from lung cancer. So th there is no safe level of radiation. The radiation is a genotoxic exposure, even small levels contribute to cancer. We know this. We regulate it as a genotoxic, or as many of my students in this room will know, as a, a linear risk scenario. So just to put it into context, we are receiving increased levels of Becquerels here in Canada, it's true, from the exposures from Japan. But we have 
I would say many bigger fish to fry in the radiation world, looking at the contribution of exposures to some things that are already here in this country at this point in time. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna Marie. That's great. Um, I uh, just want to uh, point out that Anna Marie will be joining the panel at the uh, end of today, and I think we're going to reserve questions uh, at that time so we can get back on schedule. Uh, we need to uh, be back in this room after lunch at 1:30. Uh, please enjoy your lunch and enjoy your uh, colleagues, and I'll see you in uh, 45 minutes. Yeah, good lunch.